We must have a high view of God's word. It's got the power to deliver the depressed and the oppressed. It's got the power to restore relationships. The power to save souls and save the sin. It's got the power to defeat the devil. Make one wise. Renew one's mind. Shape one's worldview. And direct one's life. Listen to me. The word of God is all sufficient. Again, it's the ultimate weapon. Well, let us bow our heads again as we prepare our hearts for God's word. Lord, through your word, we see that there are certain loves and certain desires that displease you, Lord. And so I pray, Lord God, that we would take um, John's advice and command that comes from you because your word is inspired by your spirit not to love the world nor the ways of the world, Lord, but to love what is holy and to love what is true, to love what is pure and to love what is right. And Lord, I just pray that you would continue to speak into every one of our lives and that you would continue to refine us because that's what your spirit does, Lord. Your spirit refines us and makes us more like Christ. So I pray that today we would give your word our undivided attention, Lord. And don't allow the enemy, the seed thief, to, to distract or any, in any way or to intercept your word. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord, we give you this time we worship you, we honor you, we adore you, we love you, and uh, we just thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Let us open our Bibles for the fifth time to 1 John chapter 2. We're going to be reading verses 15 to 17. But go ahead and leave your marker there for a moment. Today's message is titled, A Love God Hates Part 5. A Love God Hates Part 5. Five. As you know, so far we've skimmed over lovers of self, lovers of money, and lovers of pleasure. And I'm trusting that the Lord has been using and blessing this series on A Love God Hates to remind us of humanity's fallenness and to remind us of our dire need for Jesus Christ. Amen? I know I say this many times and I think it's important to repeat it. Jesus' death on the cross doesn't only save us from eternal hell, okay? He doesn't, it doesn't only save us from the eternal penalty of sin, but it also saves us from today's enslaving power of sin. Can I get an amen? amen. Jesus died so that we would live free from all these loves that God hates, all these lusts really and desires that really are of the world. And it's not to say that we won't be gripped by these desires from time to time, but Jesus died so that you and I would not be enslaved to those desires. Yeah, we may be pulled by it every now and then. But through the cross of Jesus Christ, He gives us the power to live for God. Amen? Amen. In 2 Corinthians 5.15, it says, And He, speaking of Jesus, died for all. Listen, listen why He did this. Listen to why He did this. It says that He, Jesus, died for all so that those who live, or those who are born again, those who have new life, says should live no longer for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again see that Jesus died to free us from living for ourselves, but rather to live for Jesus Christ who gave his life for us that's the reason why he died sometimes we think that he just died so that way we wouldn't go to hell and be forgiven of all our sins but in reality he also died so that way we would no longer live for ourselves in other words he died so that way we would no longer live for the lust of the eyes the lust of the flesh and the pride of life but rather live for God listen it is possible to live for a holy God in a corrupt and fallen world can I get an amen, amen. Because it is Christ and His power, His Spirit, and His Word that makes it possible. One may ask, I want to die to sin. I want to overcome sin in my life, but I just don't know how. How do I do it? 
How do I overcome sin? How do I die to the sin that I still see in my life? Well, before we read 1 John chapter 2, let us go to Romans chapter 6. We're going to read verses 10 and 11, and here we're going to find the answer. If you find yourself uh, becoming enslaved to certain sins, today you can be free if you just recognize what God has done for you. Can I get an amen? amen. Let us read here in Romans chapter 6. We're going to read verses 10 and 11. And it says, For the death that he died, he died to sin. That is the penalty and the power of it. Once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. This is the key. Likewise, you also reckon. Your translation may say consider, but I want you to underline that word right there. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed or really dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord what is the key you reckon that means you view you consider you think you regard you know that you have died with Jesus Christ when he died on the cross and by faith you rose from the dead when he rose to live in newness of life amen, amen? Yes. Hey, give him praise hallelujah Because at times it seems to me that we complicate things. We complicate things. All we have to do, it says here, is to reckon. That is to see and believe yourselves to be truly dead to sin and alive to God. He's saying, just know it. It's a fact. It's a fact. It's already a done deal. You are dead to the power of sin in your life. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm not speaking of sinless perfection. We're always going to have the residue of that old nature what I'm talking about is the power and the chains of sin in our lives we don't have to be lovers of self we don't have to be lovers of money we don't have to be lovers of pleasure and we're gonna see here that we don't have to be lovers of praise why because Jesus made it possible by dying on the cross and raising from the dead know that know that amen, amen. Jesus bless us with that said, let us read here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. Again, today's focus is lovers of praise. Lovers of praise. Verse 15. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. We already went over that. It's not talking about nature, people. It's not talking about food, animals, trees, oceans, stuff like that. It's talking about the fallen, corrupt system of this world. So it says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the lust and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So what we're going to do for a moment is this. We're going to look at the differences between the Pharisees and Jesus in regards to this love for praise. We know Jesus didn't have it and we'll see in detail, but the Pharisees, they were basically, the Pharisees and the scribes, they were basically the epitome or the poster boys of lovers of praise. You guys know that very well. We've had studies on the Pharisees. Uh, the praise and recognition of man was their highest love. Their, the praise and recognition of man was their highest love. Okay, That's the way the Pharisees lived. They lived so that men would be in awe of them, would be impressed by them. They literally lived for the praise of man. So we're going to see the difference and the contrast here. It really is night and day. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 23. We'll be focusing on 5 and 7. Matthew 23, 5 to 7. We're going to see the contrast between the Pharisees and Jesus in regards to this praise of men. When you're there, go ahead and say amen. amen. Matthew 23, 5 to 7. But all their works, Jesus is speaking of the Pharisees and scribes, but all their works, they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feast, 
the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Jesus says all their works they do to be seen by men. Now for us as believers and disciples of Jesus Christ, we know that everything we do, we do to be seen by God. You see, their only motive was to please men and to get praise. That was it. The main reason for everything they did was simply to impress men. And in doing so, they impressed for praise. I'll impress you, you praise me. That was their attitude. And that's the kind of love that God hates. Can I get an amen? amen. They used false religion, conduct for oohs and ahs and applause. They impressed everyone but they impacted no one. But for the Christian, we have an audience of one, the Holy One, the Living One, Jesus Christ, amen? We do everything in the sight of God. We, we, we do our best to do everything for the glory of God. You see, the reason why they were able to impress everyone but not impact everyone was because, again, they did life they did life in a way where it was all about them. You see, when you live for the praise of men, you can't live for the good of men too. You can't have two masters. Either you're going, about, you're going to go about and flaunt everything you are and everything you can do so that way men can praise you or, or you can use what God has given you to bless others. And that's what the Pharisees failed to do. And I pray that we would not through the power of Christ. Amen? Yes. But on the other hand, as disciples of Christ, we are called to do again everything to be seen of God and to be pleasing to God above all else. Listen, church, we're not circus clowns. That's what the Pharisees were. We're, not, we're representatives of Jesus Christ the Lord. We're not actors. We're not actresses. And this world is not our red carpet, it's not our runway, and it's not our catwalk. It is our mission field. Amen? You were not created and equipped with the, with the Spirit's power, with the knowledge of the Word, and, and with the character of Christ to impress people, but to impact people. That's why you exist. That's the reason why Jesus Christ saved you. You are different than the world. See, the world has this Hollywood mindset. You and I must have the mind of Jesus Christ. We exist to turn men's eyes to Christ, not to treasure them for ourselves in any way. Jesus goes on to say here, they make their phylacteries broad. Some of you may be thinking, what in the world is a phylactery? This is the first time I've ever heard that word. Sounds kind of strange. But it's a small leather box worn on the forehead. And this is what the Pharisees wore. It was a small leather box. And it was filled with Old Testament scripture. And they would wear these things every time they would go to the temple and pray. Or if they stood on the corner of the street in public and prayed. They made sure they had these phylacteries tied to their foreheads. But it says here that they broadened their phylacteries. <laughs> As basically saying is that they had a larger box than they should hanging on their forehead to impress people. So what people thought was, wow, they must have a whole lot of scripture in that big old shoe box tied to their forehead, right? <laughs> and that was the point. The Lord is saying, I hate this stuff. You see, they had those things and they had a, a good reason and that was to remember scripture, to remember to love it, to remember to obey it, right? It's on the forehead, so it, it's like uh, the word of God should always be in our minds, right? But they turned it around and they made it an opportunity of praise for self. And the Lord doesn't like that. Can I get an amen? amen? They wanted to make their religiosity as visible and as impressive as possible. This is just a footnote. I've noticed that the Bible never says that Jesus wore a phylactery. If he did, please find it and let me know. But I don't think it's ever said that. Not saying that he never did, but the Bible says he never did. And I thought, well, this makes perfect sense because he's the word of God made flesh. 
He doesn't need a little box hanging on his forehead. He is the, the, the box, if you will, right? The vessel that carries the word of God, both Old and New Testament. He's the word made flesh. Another thing I thought about was this. These men had an outward expression of religion, not an inward expression of relationship with God. And that's another thing Jesus was teaching. Listen, they got religion outside of them. You ought to have the Word of God inside of you. Amen? Amen. And that's the way of it. Jesus had the Word inside of him because he is the Word made flesh. The Pharisees had the Word outside of them to impress others. That's the difference. Amen? How do we know that we have the Word living inside of us? Well, we know it because we allow the Word of God to correct us. We allow the Word of God to guide us. We allow the Word of God to shape us and mold us and direct us and to make us more like Christ. Amen? We allow the Word of God to discipline us. We allow the Word of God to bless us. And that's how we know when the Word of God is living inside of us. We desire it and we do our very best to obey it. Why? Because we love God and we love His Word. That's how we know. But these Pharisees, they did not have that type of love. They did not have that type of love. It says they enlarged their borders of their garments. In other words, the garments, as you know, are clothing. And they made sure that their robes were very long, they were very thick, and they were very broad and wide. And the reason why was because when they walked, they wanted their robe to cover as much as ground as possible. See? So that way, even when people came, there was still some, a good amount of clothing between them and the person in front of them. The whole point was, I want you to see how holy and righteous I am with my holy and quote-unquote righteous clothing on. I want to impress you. See, the Lord says, I don't like that. I don't like that. We're not called again to impress. We're called to impact. Amen? It says they broadened and enlarged what they had. And again, it was all for just the effect. It wasn't real. Jesus knew it wasn't real. Uh, much of the people were deceived by it, but some weren't. Their mindset was bigger and better. That's what attracts. All eyes on them was their life's prize. That's what they prized. That was their reward, and Jesus said it. They paraded themselves for praise. That's the picture here. And listen to this. Before we say, well, hey, at least we're not like that, let us be very careful. Because even today, many do that with clothing today. They dress only to impress and listen, even cause others to sin because of it. So I say, let us dress modest to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. We're not called to be eye catchers. We're called to be soul winners. We're called to be fishers of men. That is the fishers of men's souls. We're not called to be fishers of men's eyes or compliments or praise or approval. Can I get an amen? And some of us may say, well, we don't have this problem like the Pharisees do. If, if we're not careful, we can. And at times, church, we do. And that's the reason why we acknowledge it and turn from it. Can I get an amen? The Lord goes on to say they loved. They loved the best places at feast and they love the best seat in the synagogue notice the word best twice you see they thought they were the best and so because they thought they were the best they wanted the best places everywhere they went you see they lived for the attention of men and the sad thing here it says it says the sad thing here is it says the best seat in the synagogue now the synagogue was basically a house of prayer it would be like church today they wanted the best places, whether it was, you know, in some non-religious setting or in some religious setting. They wanted to be the center of attraction everywhere they went. This is the love of the world and not the love of the Father. This is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Amen? This is what the Lord does not want from us. They wanted to always be the main attraction. Listen, if they were at a wedding... They wanted to be the bridegroom. If they were at a birthday party, they wanted to be the birthday boy. If they were at a baby dedication, they wanted to be, guess what? The baby. When they were at a funeral, they wanted to be the corpse. 
the dead body, when they were at church, they wanted to be God. You see? These men lived for the eyes and the praise of men. They were the center of attention. And again, this is the corrupt attitude. This is the corrupt attitude for a love of praise or a yearn for praise that God hates. Why? Because it doesn't put him first and it doesn't put others first. It puts us first. It says here they loved places of honor and respect. They loved the best seat in the house. Again, both religious and non-religious gatherings. Notice it never says they loved God. Jesus never said that. It never says they loved the word. It never says they loved their neighbor. It never says they loved to worship God. It never says they loved to pray. Well, they loved to pray in public only to impress, but they didn't love to pray, to talk to God. What the Bible does tell us is this. They loved acting like it and being praised for. And I, and I got to say, the love of praise in regards to religion and ministry is probably one of the worst of them all. Can I get an amen? Because we pull God by name into our pride, and that is horrible. And that is horrible. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi, rabbi. You see, when they're in the marketplace, maybe they were over there at a Circle K or some QT. Well, maybe they didn't have them at that time. Huh? Um, <laughs> Circle J, Jew, never mind, Jerusalem, never, never mind. So they're out there and the people would see them and they would say, oh, teacher, teacher. And that, 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 made, them, that made them puff up with him. It was kind of like a high. It was kind of like a drug. But what, what, you know, you, call, you called, you noticed me. And that was their attitude everywhere they went. They loved to be called rabbi. They loved it. Again, they loved public acknowledgement. They viewed themselves as more important or superior. They loved to be called rabbi, rabbi. It's like saying, someone important, someone important. Can I talk to you for a minute? <laughs> well, maybe, right, you know. If, if, only if I'm not praying, you know, but that's the way they were. That was their attitude. It's horrible. It's despicable, really. And they saw themselves as better. They saw themselves as high class. And due to their religious accomplishments and positions, they expected proper address. They loved titles. They loved to be called rabbi. They loved to be called teacher. Just like men love to be called doctor or pastor or some other name. The Lord says, I don't want that from you. In fact, he tells them, you should be happy and content with just being called brother. That's enough. He says, there's only one teacher and I'm it. The Lord speaking. Amen? Amen. And by the way, if some of you like to call me pastor, that's fine. But I want you to know that I'm happy with just being called brother or sonny. I'm cool with that. Why? Because all the glory goes to Jesus Christ. This is not about titles. This is not about people. This is about the glory of Jesus. Amen? Amen. I know that in the Hispanic culture, Hispanic community, it's, it's, it's almost disrespectful not to, uh, you know, um, address someone by their title. But according to God's word, uh, that's not the case. Amen? We are, we are to be called brother. And it shouldn't bother us one bit. Can I get an amen? Regarding the Pharisees, one commentator wrote, and I love this. He says, they love the praise of men, which is nothing but stinking breath. They got their reward. That, that's one way to look at it, right? When, the, when men praised these Pharisees, all they really got was a whiff of bad breath. These people didn't brush their teeth. All they got was a whoo-wee. Right? You said something nice, but you ought to brush those teeth, you know. But that's the reality. The praise of man is a breath. It's here and it's gone. It's audible for a second. Forget about it. Amen? What we live for is, well done, my good and faithful servant, coming from the breath, as Brother James said earlier, that gives life. Amen? We want to hear it from God. Amen? That's what you want. You want to know that you are approved in the sight of God. Far more than you are approved in the sight of men. Amen? 
He is worthy, church. He is worthy. The Pharisees and the scribes used their outward religious acts to, again, impress for praise. But the reality, again, is that we can use other things to impress for praise. For example, we can use talent to impress for praise. We can use beauty. Again, we can use ministry. We can use knowledge. We can use skills. We can use accomplishments, power, possessions, positions, wealth, and so on and so on. Sometimes we think, well, we can never be like the Pharisees. Check again. Sometimes we can be, and when we see it, we turn from it. Amen? I mentioned beauty. I, heard of a, I read an article recently of a young model. Uh, she um, desired to be eventually a supermodel someday. And the thing, that, the thing that pushed her the most was that she loved the fact that she was beautiful. She thought she was very beautiful and she loved the compliments of others. She loved for people to say, oh, you are gorgeous. She lived for that. She lived for that. And one day, an insult came to her. Why? Because she was so used to living for compliments. Oh, you're so pretty. Oh, look at you. Look at this. And oh, she just loved it. But one day, a person told her, Oh, you're fat. You're this and you're that. And guess what happened to this young, beautiful uh, woman who was created in the image of God? She began to starve herself. She stayed away from food. And, and then she, she was uh, brought down with anorexia. She couldn't hold food down anymore. And she died. She died. Why? Because, because, again, she loved the praise of men. She lived for people just complimenting her. That was her high. In fact, one of the reporters said this, the tragic waste of a woman whose childhood dreams of be being a cover girl came true, but for all the wrong reasons. What was the wrong reason? A love for praise. And don't misunderstand me. Listen, it's good to acknowledge people. It's good to honor. It's good to appreciate. It's good to give credit where credit is due. It's good to affirm. We have to affirm people, right? Uh, we're encouraged by that. Uh, we, we don't, we're not fulfilled by it. We're not satisfied by it. It's not our idol or God. No, but we're encouraged by it. So it's okay to admire. It's okay to honor. It's even okay to praise others. But again, it's only when we do it in a proper way and with humility Amen. with humility knowing first and foremost that it is God who has made us and it is God who has blessed us so if for whatever reason anybody acknowledges something you do well just say glory be to God like he gave me this talent he gave me this ability he gave me what I have listen what do we have that God has not given us isn't that what Paul says? That's a great question, isn't it? The next time we're tempted to be fat-headed or to be prideful in any way, just ask yourself this reason. Why are you prideful? What for? That's a humbling question, isn't it? Because we don't have anything that God has not given us. We were created again with a need for affirmation, but not to make an idol out of it. Proverbs 27 and verse 2 says, Let another man praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. The Lord doesn't want us praising ourselves. The Lord doesn't want us broadening our phylacteries and enlarging our robes and garments, right? He doesn't want us doing that. He doesn't want us advertising ourselves. He wants us to live for His glory and His glory alone. Can I get an amen? Amen. But we live in a time where that is so accessible, isn't it? Channels, social media. Listen, we can fall into this trap from one day to the next if we don't have our heads screwed on straight, church. It's all about Jesus. Amen? Hallelujah. Lord, put this in our hearts. In Matthew chapter 23... We were told that the Pharisees did everything to impress men for praise. But Jesus, on the other hand, he didn't do that. He didn't do that. In John 5, 41, Jesus says, I do not receive honor from men. Listen to this, church. 
You want to know your Savior better? Know this about him. He says, I do not receive honor from men. In other words, he's saying, I don't live for the praise of human beings. That's powerful. This is God in the flesh. He didn't allow the praise of men to move him or to, or to change his direction or to change his way of thinking or to change his mission or, or plans or, or purposes. No, it was always to the glory of God the Father. He came as the last Adam to teach us that and to live it out. Can I get an amen? Jesus didn't perform countless miracles like healing the sick and delivering the demonically possessed or turning water into wine or walking on water or multiplying bread and fish so that men would be impressed and praise him. He didn't do those things like the Pharisees did their thing for men to praise them and to look at them and to admire them and to watch them. Jesus didn't. He did so so that he would reveal himself as God that they might believe and be saved. That was the difference. <laughs> Jesus didn't live for praise. He lived to save. The Pharisees lived for praise and they perished because of it. You see the difference? On the other hand, when men were sincere like Thomas who praised Jesus by saying, my Lord and my God, Jesus received that sincere praise. But listen, he never craved it because he doesn't need it. We need him. Jesus never craved the applause or the attention or the crowd in the wrong way. If he did anything, he did it so that way their souls would be saved, their eyes would be opened, and their lives would be changed. That's it. Jesus said, I have come to do the will of my Father, not to impress men, to save them. Amen? To save them. Again, in John 5, 41 and 42, it says, I do not receive honor from men, but I know you, he tells them. I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. Isn't this what John said in 1 John chapter 2? If anyone loves the world, that is the, the love of praise, the love of the Father is not in him. Listen, this is just John expounding the teachings of Christ. Jesus says, you don't have the love of the Father. You can't love the Father because you love the honor and the glory and the praise of men. You cannot have two masters, he told them. You cannot love me because you don't love God. You love yourself above God. That's what he was telling them. He says, I know you. Why did Jesus talk to them like that? It was because he can see right through the hearts of men like crystal clear water. But the people were deceived. They didn't know the full heart of the Pharisee. Jesus did. And he cracked it wide open for everybody to see. Can I get an amen? He exposed them. He exposed them. Jesus is teaching that one of the reasons why many will not come to Jesus and be saved is because they esteem. Listen to me. They esteem. They value the approval and praise of humans more than God. And that's the reason why you don't hear many famous, rich, and powerful people coming to Jesus. Why? Because they love the praise of men. If I give my life to Jesus... I have to de deny myself and put him first. Men don't want to do that. Why? Because, again, they love praise for themselves. They love their praise more than Jesus. And again, his command is to, de to, to deny one's self. If you want to know why many people won't come to Jesus, it's that simple. They love their own praise. And they're not about to share that or to give that to no one, not even God. That's the problem. We see this again in John chapter 12 and verse 42. It tells us that many Jews, rulers, believed in Jesus, but because of the Pharisees, listen to this, but because of men, 
Because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Some of the rulers knew that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. They believed. But because they would much rather have the approval of the Pharisees of men, they denied Christ. They loved the approval of men above the approval of God. In fact, John chapter 12 verse 43 says, For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Isn't this the way of Christ rejectors? They only care about what fallen humanity thinks of them and they can care less about what God their creator thinks of them? How many people do you know that just think, wow, what is God thinking about me? Does God approve of my lifestyle, my thoughts, my goals and desires and dreams in life? How many people live like that and talk like that and actually mean it? Not many. But I will tell you this, they live to please men. They live for comments. They live for loves. They live for views. They live for the approval of men. They're thinking about people all day long. When they dress, they think of others. Whatever it is they do and buy, they think of others. If not first themselves. How many people do everything to the glory of God? They're just constantly thinking about, what does God think about me? What does God think about this? Can I get an amen? amen. Give God praise in this house today. This is what it means to be a lover of praise. And listen, being ashamed of Jesus in everyday life is closely connected to the love of praise. Did you know that? The reason why these rulers didn't come to Jesus was because they were afraid. They were afraid of the Pharisees. They were afraid of men. And so they denied Jesus. They were ashamed of, of, of what they believed. And so if we're ashamed, we're lovers of praise. And we need to repent. Because what happens is this. We care more about what this fallen world thinks about the glory of the gospel and the, and the gospel message more than we do about what God thinks about the glorious gospel. And so yes, we might, not like, we, not, we might not like the praise of men necessarily, but we don't like the rejection of men. And that too is to love praise, believe it or not. It goes together. And so I'm encouraging you, you here today, if you're one who loves praise, repent. Turn from it, the Lord will heal you from it, trust me. Take it to God in prayer, wrestle with Him. Let Him um, dislocate your hip like Jacob, you know, get the blessing. Get healed. But if you're one here today and you're ashamed of the gospel, you hardly ever share it. When people bring it up, you want to hide in a hole. You need to repent from that too. Why? Because you are a representative of Jesus Christ. And if you're not speaking for him and living for him, you're a bad representative and you're ashamed of Jesus Christ. But listen, Jesus is not ashamed of you. And if you find yourself in that place today, he'll pick you up and give you strength and give you everything you need to be a good representative if you would surrender to him and, and forget about what this world says. Amen? Yes, the yes give him praise. The Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it's the power of God to save anyone who would believe. I'm not ashamed. Why? Because it's the most important message in all the universe. We should be ashamed of many things, but not that. Can I get an amen? In closing, persons who pursue praise will always end up empty. They will always end up confused and they will always end up disappointed. Why? Well, for one, people are fickle. We learned that on Wednesday. People change their minds too quickly. The praise they'll give you today, they'll give to someone else tomorrow. What happened to that young model rising up? Her praise was given to someone else and it killed her, literally. So forget about that. This bottom line is that we were not created to be worshipped. We were created to worship the one triune God. Amen. 
We were not created to be worshipped. We were created to worship. And anytime we live outside of the designs and plans and purposes of God, we will become miserable. Miserable. We were created to worship God and God alone. Can I get an amen? In fact, Psalm 115, 1 says, Not to us, Lord. And then he repeats it, so that way it's emphatic and we get it. Not to us, but to your name. What? Be the glory. See, all the glory is the Lord's. All the glory is the Lord's. Even the affirmations and the compliments and the praises you get from men, even if it's in a good way, that too goes to the Lord. Because everything comes from the Lord. And whatever comes from the Lord goes back to the Lord in praise. Can I get an amen? Yeah. For example, again, men were not made to be worshipped. For example, you have Nebuchadnezzar. He was a lover of praise, a lover of power. And that love literally turned him into a beast <laughs> for seven years. A beast, a literal beast. God was teaching him a lesson. See, Nebuchadnezzar, he had a great, great empire. The Babylonian empire was second to none in his time. And he said, I did this. I did this. And God said, wait a minute. I put kings in their positions and I take them down. And guess what he did to him? He took him down. See, God will share his glory with no one. There are two things he won't share. His glory and his woman, the church. Amen? And if any man touches either or, they are going down. Either destroyed or disciplined, but they will bow. Amen? So Nebuchadnezzar, he became an animal for seven years until he repented. He came to his senses. He was like, okay, you're the one true God. I get it. I, I get it. Please don't do that again, you know. <laughs> seven years living like an animal was a long time. He was used to golden cups. He was out there eating and grazing like an animal. And then you have uh, Herod, Agrippa the first. He comes out and he had this, this oratory about him. This is a gift that God gives men. But he used it for his own glory. And because of that, God struck him. And he turned him into worm's food on the spot. He said he didn't give glory to God. Listen, both Christians and non-Christians should give glory to God because God deserves all the glory. Amen? It doesn't change. We will all face God on that day. I want to close with this passage, Philippians 2, verses 3 to 11. 3 to 11, please read with me. This is the right mindset, church. This is the right mindset. And God cannot and will not use us to the level that He desires to unless this becomes a reality in our hearts. And listen to me, it is a battle. But it, it is won when we surrender. Amen? Amen. 5 to 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Wow, the same mind and attitude that Jesus had. Paul says, I want you to have it too. 6. Who being in the form of God, in other words, he is God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself. Okay, let us stop there for a second. You need to make yourself. Right? He made himself of no reputation. This is, a, this is a decision we make. We say, you know what, Lord? I am lower than you. You are the greatest. I will humble myself. I will humble my myself. And it says, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. So this is the picture. God, creator of the universe, of heaven and earth, and every single thing that you see, plants, animals, of uh, fruit, trees, rivers, oceans, the creator of all things. He comes down in the form of a human. He became man, a bond servant. Serving who? Serving God and serving others. This is God. He came all the way down to wash the feet of men. One of them was a traitor. He says, I want you to be the same way. Yeah, you might be something. You might have something, but bring that down. 
and serve God and others with it. Can I get an amen? amen. And so it goes on to say here, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Whoa, that's ultimate obedience, by the way. Nine, therefore, because of this, because of his humility, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow or will bow. And those of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, just meaning everyone, everywhere in the universe, on the earth, angels, demons, everyone. Eleven, and that every tongue, every tongue, even those who deny him, who use their tongues to say God does not exist, even those should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory. Where is it at? Where is the glory? To the glory of God the Father. Amen. Jesus put praise in the right place. He stripped it from man and said, Father, here it is. Here it is. What a beautiful thing the Lord has done. Amen. 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 So, do you want to find where true exaltation is in the sight of God, approval and praise from God? Yes, you are to be brought low. You are to humble yourself. And that's why the Bible says, humble yourselves and God will raise you up. What does that mean? That means humble yourselves and God will use you. God will bless you. God will draw you near to Him. If you can be a humble instrument, then He will strum it with a smile on His face. Can I get an amen? Give God praise in this house today. Let us stand to our feet.